So, good evening. My name is Hal Gage. Welcome to the fourth First Monday Art Presentations. The format for tonight, as it is for each Monday, is four presenting artists share their work for 15 minutes. I started this event as a way to reconnect with my fellow artists after this long pandemic isolation. If you or someone you know would like to present, please have them drop me an email at halgage at alaska.net. This is not a traditional Zoom meeting, but rather a live presentation by four artists. Please keep your mics muted for the duration of the presentations. At the end, I will open it up for questions. So uh, our first presenter tonight is uh, Mark Dott. He's a photographer living in Seattle, Washington. I first met Mark when he was a uh, curator of ex exhibitions at the Alaska State Museum in Juneau a position he held for 15 years before retiring in 2006. But I knew his work long before I had met him. Uh, whenever his work showed up in the statewide traveling shows, it was always done so with a splash. Mark has been making art for over 50 years. His work has been in exhibitions locally, nationally, and internationally. He has, uh, he was, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I gotta get it. He had the only artwork uh, selected to represent Alaska in the West Staff uh, Brooklyn Museum Third West State, Third Western States Exhibition in 1986. And he was a recipient of an uh, individual artist fellowship from the Alaska State Council on the Arts. So we'll turn it over to you, Mark. Go right ahead. All right. Thanks, Al. This is going to be a condensed retrospective look at my whole career in art. So. I got to get going on it. Let's see. This is my first artwork. I made it when I was five years old. Pressed my hand into porcelain. It was dried, glazed, put in the kiln, came out, and it was alchemy to me. I just loved it. So many years later, <laughs> I'm still doing this thing. That was how I looked when it came out of the kiln. I grew up in Culver City, California, which was where the Hollywood movies are made. And they called it that because there was a cluster of major film studios in that area, the biggest being MGM. And MGM uh, had a back lot of 165 acres and a clever kid could scale that fence and have this fantasy world, which is what I did. And I like to think that influenced my work later in life. So MGM uh, was, you know, the big shot in the game there. And they had this, uh, this constellation of contract players that were uh, just amazing for, for that time. In 1939, they hit the high water mark by releasing Gone with the Wind and The Wizard of Oz, both in the same year. And that, um, <clears throat> that fabled Yellow Brick Road can still be found in uh, stage 26 and what is now Sony Pictures. And from what I understand, soon to be Amazon Pictures. I wanted to touch on a couple of movies that made a difference in my life. One is the 1960 release of The Time Machine. And it's because of this, The Time Machine, this conveyance was actually built in a garage just a couple of doors down, <clears throat> excuse me, from my childhood home. So I would go in there and watch this guy put this beautiful sculpture together and it was most impressive. And the other one I, movie I wanted to mention was Soylent Green released in 1973. It's, um, it's futuristic movie uh, in a dystopian overpopulated overheated world in the year 2022. And uh, this is a picture of MGM still of the uh, riot police scooping up those that are out of control, they get dumped in the back of these truck beds and carted off and they become Soylent Green. Lower right highlighted there, that's me. I was one of the extras in the movie. Whoops, that's my pay stub. <laughs> and that's me with the other actors. In August of 1967, I was one of a five man crew uh, that sailed this 48 foot sloop from Honolulu to Los Angeles. The guy that took the picture here is named Tom Tucker. He was a photographer that kind of hitched a ride. 
And I'd never seen anybody work cameras like this. He was all over the place all the time. Eventually, he made a book of the Ocean Passage. That's Tom in the straw hat. And this may very well be the very first photograph I took using Tom's camera. In 1967, I began high school. And uh, the program at my high school allowed students to take photography every semester for the course of the time that uh, they were there. And so I did that. It was also the year that I got my driver's license. And so Southern California was filled with exciting things back there. Uh, back then, war protests, concerts, love-ins, be-ins. This is a group of Hell's Angels that asked me if I would photograph them. So. Yes, of course I did. And uh, by the time 1970 rolled around, I had taken six semesters of photography and was fairly confident, confident enough to talk my way through security and get on the stage at this Who concert in Anaheim, California. It was a good day. In 1973, I moved to Arcata, California to start a college there at California State University, Humboldt. And I began as a forestry student, but uh, quickly realized that was a bad fit for me. So I switched to a degree in art and uh, inspired by the work of Richard Abaddon, Dion Arbus, Irving Penn, I began photographing uh, subjects in front of plain backgrounds. And ultimately, uh, put together my first solo exhibition in Arcata. That's a selfie, by the way, called Watch the Birdie. Um, during one of my class sessions, somebody came and gave a demonstration on applying transparent oil colors to black and white photographs. And so uh, I liked that. And I started doing that. And I've done it for a long time. In 1976, I moved from Los Angeles to a one room tar paper shack in Juneau, Alaska and continued to do my photographic work a little larger in scale. This is about 11 by 14 inches and continue with painting the subjects to highlight a subject or downplay another, photographing while traveling or in Southeast Alaska. That's my paint kit, well used. And I continue to this day to do what I call street work, kind of in the, uh, like Robert Frank or Lee Friedlander or Gary Winograd, and mostly during my travels. That's Istanbul before the pandemic. Also like to uh, photograph visitors to museums, looking at art, like this fellow at the Rex Museum, or these folks at SF MoMA, or not looking at art. <laughs> In 1977, a friend of mine and myself found these uh, vintage mannequins in uh, an old department store. And we bought them and didn't do anything with them for quite a while. But in 1984, we uh, drug them out and set them up in front of the Mendenhall Glacier and photographed them right at the height of the tourist season. So that was fun. This one is called Dick and the Boys Narrowly Escape an Advancing Glacier. In uh, 1984, I received a Alaska State Council on the Arts Fellowship. And part, with part of that money, I purchased a four by five camera. And that purchase changed my work significantly because you have to slow way down to uh, use a camera like that. And so the setups became a little more elaborate. This is from uh, the Seven Deadly Sins series, Sin of Lust, and the Sin of Gluttony. This one I titled, I Will Now Remove the Bandages. 
And this uh, a more elaborate installation called Postmortem. I borrowed that gurney from the hospital and the chart in the back from the university and the scale from the grocery store and the furniture came from various sources. It was all set up in a, food, uh, a fish processing room. You can actually see ice on the floor and the walls are splattered with blood, so it was perfect. This is the treasures of Tutankhamun. I set this up in a storage rental unit, covered the walls with insulating foam and carved that, degraded it and so on. And then my friend Dan DeRue painted the hieroglyphs on the wall. In uh, 1984 also, um, we took Dick on the family vacation and I built that box that was much like a coffin and bolted it to the top of the car. And we went down the West Coast and saw the sights. And Dick was always a, a great traveling companion. Made it all the way out to Wisconsin. But one of the, the wonderful things about a road trip like that is coming home and telling your stories to those that will listen. This is Dick returning on the ferry to Juneau, telling his stories. In 1986, I traded in the mannequins for live models and began making these larger, these are uh, 20 by 24 inch black and white prints. This is called Black Sheep and the companion to Black Sheep is Safe Sex. They were both a uh, comment on the AIDS epidemic at that time. Bad Dog. This is called the Ostrich. Uh, during the Gulf War, I imagined when the bombs dropped on the desert, they created glass. Pedigree. The Shaman. And the Banquet. They all have a story, but in 15 minutes, I can't go into every story. <laughs> uh, during the same time, I began making objects inspired by uh, the work of Joseph Cornell. I started with shadow boxes. Uh, this one is a comment on global warming. This one is called, um, oh, what is it? I can't remember now. But it's, oh, it's about a draw in chess, stalemate. Um, and it's about the Afghan war. That's an antique Afghan map in the back of the box or inside of the box. This is called The Nest, about marriage. This is uh, the Traveler's Temple. Bones and Brass. Exit Strategy, that's about a foot tall. And that's the bomb that I made out of a bowling ball. So it has some real mass when you lift it. I had to ship it once. That was interesting. That's the flood. That's only about four inches long. The mummy. Bird brain. Candy man. That's a life-size plastic human skull. And pearl man. This is a detail of a piece I call the fire. Those are um, foam blocks that are carved and painted to look like stones with a light inside that flickers so it looks like an actual fire going. There's the happy campers with the fire in front of them. And this is an installation view of the fire with the last Eskimo. This is dry book, no, wet book dried. I put this book in a bucket of water and let it totally get soaked, pulled it out, dried it, photographed it. And this is a piece during COVID time called The End. In 1997, I had the occasion to visit a friend on Unalaska Island, and we walked from the North Sea side to the Bering Sea side. And I was so taken with it that I took a sample on a whim of the Bering Sea and thus began my uh, water collection. Each specimen is documented like this with the collection site, the date, the collector, and the number of the collection. This is a, a box that exhibits some of the specimens. This was taken at Monet's Lily Pond, collection number 48 from underneath the famous Japanese bridge. This collection at the House of the Virgin Mary, 
And it is said that uh, this water has special curative properties. So I tried some. And the exception to this collection is a glass of Chardonnay taken from uh, Governor Tony Knoll's glass at his inauguration. It ultimately became a book. Uh, in 2001, I was dealing with, as we all were, this moment. And this started a series uh, that I began uh, recreating iconic photographs from the history of photojournalism. Now, this one is the only uh, exception to the rule in that it was a compilation of photographs that I created the sculpture made out of cardboard and steel wool plastic. This is uh, Joe Rosenthal's, make, arguably the most famous photograph in the world. This is my rendition of it. Those are one foot tall GI Joes. Uh, Dorothea Lang's famous migrant mother. This is my migrant mo model. Uh, this is the assassination of Robert Kennedy. And this is a piece I call The Mechanics. This, I'm sure you've all seen, the uh, street execution of a South Vietnamese prisoner, or Viet Cong prisoner, excuse me. And this is my piece called Hosed. Um, currently, I'm, I've been doing uh, still lives based on Flemish and Dutch still life paintings in the studio. This one's called The Workshop, Lazarus, The Apprentice, Lucky Strike, and The Traveler. And just to give you some idea of scale, that's about 45 inches wide. And recently, uh, during the pandemic, my wife and I have taken to walking our neighborhood in West Seattle just to get out of the house and, you know, calm yourself. And I began noticing these covered vehicles and photographing them. And so I, I just like the way they look, the way they reflect the light. They have a certain mystery to them. Some have been around forever like this and some like this late model Corvette in this bespoke glove that it's just, you know, there for its protection. Some you don't know what it is. Like, what's that? Also, I just made a book of these. It's about a hundred of these draped vehicles in the book. And at the end of the book, you have to have the picture of the author. So that's my picture of the author. And you remember the first slide I showed you of the, the impression of the five-year-old hand. That's that hand today. Thank you. <laughs> Sharon. Great, Mark. That was absolutely fantastic. I know everybody's got lots of questions for Mark, <laughs> but hold them till the end. Um, that was absolutely superb. So let's see. Our next presenters are Tammy Phelps and Carrie Feldman. They live in Anchorage, Alaska. Tammy works mainly in cold wax painting and assemblage. Her work is included in the permanent collection of the Santa Fe, New Mexico Museum of Encaustic Art and the Anchorage Museum at Rasmussen Center. Carrie is a writer and a professor emeritus of anthropology at the University of Alaska Anchorage. His book of short stories and poems, Drunk on Love, was published in 2019 in Cirque uh, Press. His novel, Alice's Trading Post, comes out in February uh, 2022, uh, Five Star Press. So uh, are you guys ready? Take her away. Uh, my name is Tammy Phelps, and I, first of all, would like to thank Alaska Photographic Center for sponsoring this event. It's been fabulous to have these first Monday presentations. Thank you to Hal for hosting them. 
I know it's a lot of work and it's really, really appreciated. And I also want to thank Don Marie Riley for helping me <laughs> learn how to do Zoom. And, and <laughs> what I'm doing now, being a little nervous and confused is no reflection on you, Don Marie. Um, I have a lot that I want to say and I find in situations like this, sometimes if I read it, it's a little better because then I don't forget things. As much as I'd like to talk off the cuff, I've got some things I'd like to read. And I'd like to start off by um, reading a little bit about my process and then uh, I'm just gonna read. Painting with cold wax allows me to express my sensorial self through the rhythm of a combination of beeswax and oil paint gliding across my canvas. A subtle depth of organic and textural complexity is the satisfying result. My art is a conceptual reflection of a life lived 50 years in Alaska through enjoyment of nature, music, movement, contemplation, resourcefulness, possibilities, and self-permission. I've never met an antique store I didn't like. Images of future art is endless as I explore what might have once made life beautiful or perhaps painful to someone else long ago. Stories percolate. I get energized as thoughts of vintage treasures tumble through my mind. Most recently, vintage baby dresses I attach to cradle boards to create a 3D canvas on which I paint. The woman within series that we'll be sharing with you this evening is the continuation of my exploration of being female as part of the definition of human reality. It is an expression of past, present, and future through an homage to baby girls and future women within them. A broader interpretation of my paintings offered a bit later in this presentation through poetry of my husband, Carrie Feldman, as we collaborate on this, our second project together. I'll be sharing a slideshow here now of my cold wax paintings. And um, this is a collection of work that I've been doing during the pandemic. I was scheduled to do a show, but like many things, it was canceled. So I have a body of work and it's kind of evolving and it has uh, turned into a collaboration that Carrie and I are doing. Uh, the music uh, from this slideshow is by a traditional New Zealand Maori group and is called Anua. Um, I chose this song uh, for the earthy and soulful quality um, that I find it has. You may need to adjust your volume on this. I know sometimes sound is kind of tricky with Zoom. But uh, here we have a slideshow. It's about five minutes long. Uh, the Woman Within.
So that was the um, slideshow of the dresses and Carrie's going to take a minute here and talk a little bit more about um, our collaboration after he introduces himself. Um, hi, well, um, I am the first person to have seen this work as it developed and um, I was struck by many of them and when Tammy's work a show was canceled, I suggested maybe I add some poetry to them. Um, and because, you know, I've had sisters, daughter, known many women, and I've uh, never really thought that much uh, about the woman within the little girl, but I, I think it's very important. Um, and um, what our show is about or exhibit, we, we might exhibit it, might put it in a book, we don't know what we're gonna do with it yet. Um, I'll just, get, this is a little statement we have. Respect due to women in any society uh, will not occur until women's lives are equally respected with a man's, beginning with the childhood. Alaska has a high rate of violence against girls and women. Art has a responsibility to be part of the definition of human reality, of understanding ourselves within societies and within moments in time. Our collaboration offers the beauty and the power of visual art combined with the thought-provoking art of poetry. Crucial to this project is the combination of a woman's paintings about female and a man's poetic view of the woman within a girl. My poems reveal how I came to understand the complexity of being woman in a nation, valorizing male accomplishments successes, fame, and historic roles. Men and women can work together to effect equality. Uh, now, as Hal noted in my bio, which I wrote, <laughs> uh, I'm an anthropologist and most of my work has been applied. And I've worked a lot with native people and uh, based on projects they had in mind. And this poem, first poem was inspired by 
uh, work of Tammy's that she's going to put up here, which she calls me Rose. Um, and it, it occurred uh, after I reflected on a beluga hunt that I went on with the Alaska Native people many years ago in order to protect their right to hunt belugas, even though uh, I bought my daughter a save the whale thing. So it's, you know, so it's called Elephant Point. It's, it's, it's south of Kotzebue in Eschholtz Bay. Camped at Elephant Point, farther north than I thought I'd ever be. A gang of girls peeks in, laughing in chilled, salty air at my research stuff strewn about. A scale to weigh muktuk, cameras, pens, portable latrine, a sleeping bag, and canned food for a month. Their ancestors breathed here thousands of years before nylon tents, laughing together at odd sights in a day long ago, like these young women taking their place. Decades later, their joy tears into me when I learn of another corpse, abandoned like an empty tin can, an assailant seed in her, rotting with the beauty in which she walked, ran, and slept. Her grieving family, her friends, are reminded that they look like her. The dead woman girl could be any one of them. We should scream each day in this far north killing field until it becomes safe to be a native girl. Well, it's kind of intense. Uh, and uh, the variety of Tammy's work uh, resulted in a variety of my poetry. Uh, these, by the way, have been uh, run, examined by Mike Burwell, who is kind of my mentor, poetry mentor, and edited by him. Um, but he's not responsible. Music lessons. And in this poem, I refer to a man that we all miss now, um, who, uh, Sean Lyons. Music lessons. And this is uh, Tammy's work called Meet Melody. Age six, Mrs. Bradley's piano lessons. Two years later, Sister Rigoberta curved my wrist on an Oregon cello bow at puberty. Sister Dominic taught me to blow through a reed in Montana. Like Pete Fountain, I was certain. Recently, I heard her piano jazz CD and I realized I, I never knew her. I never knew men taught music till I came to Alaska. My instrument was a classical Hispanic guitar. My mentor, a mountaineering poet who hiked past Northern Lupine as wild and joyous as he. But I can't name a woman composer, not one. My brother says there are many, ignored or unknown. Why? So those are a couple poems that were inspired by Tammy's work. Um, I'll let her finish us off here. Um, that's really all we had prepared for tonight in the uh, interest of time. Um, we'll be happy to answer any questions at the end. And uh, thank you for having us. Okay, great. That was very, very nice. So moving on, we've got uh, Sheila Wine. She's a visual artist living in Anchorage, Alaska. Her studio work has been shown locally, nationally, and internationally. Her work is in private and institutional collections throughout Alaska. She, uh, she has created over 20 public artworks and received numerous awards and honors from such prestigious institutions as the NEA and the Rasmussen Foundation. She's also received grants from organizations like the Warhol and the Rockefeller Foundations. Sheila, welcome. Hello, Hal. Well, hello, everyone. The Strata series is one of three different series I've created during the pandemic. While this was work made in 2020, there were two influences from 2019 that inspired this series, 
and they provide some context for the work. The first influence was a commission piece titled Ingenieur. The Italian word ingenieur has a Latin root that means to cause, to create, to produce. The site is an engineering building. The goal was to create a layered facade of found and manipulated objects that are the detritus from our built environment and the engineering field. The piece is 14 feet tall, 12 feet wide, and approximately nine feet deep. The main issue with this concept was weight, how to create the thick multi-layered effect without compromising the wall. I often get myself into initial trouble with my concepts and this was no exception. And then I thought of signs. They are in a sense, the signature of civil engineers. Whenever you see a speed limit or a curve sign, you know an engineer designed that roadway, factoring speed, factoring the angle of the curve, et cetera. And signs are made of aluminum, which helps solve the weight issue. In this work, several hundred pieces are welded and assembled to create layers. It's a tactile history, really, of the visual strata our society stands upon. The Indio arc is the horizon line, the curvature of our one and only planet Earth. The overall effect moves from ground to colors below the arc, which are like, you know, the reds and the oranges, uh, moving into the lighter colors of the yellows and the whites. This gives both a sense of stratification and a stylized landscape. Many objects were collected through the two years of concept design and fabrication. It's really a magpie collect collection of tools that we have used to create the world as we know it. So that was the first influence. Uh, the second influence also happened in 2019, a 21 day rafting trip through the Grand Canyon. I became immersed in the layers of rock strata while floating back in time 1.8 billion years. I could see the stories of geological time. There was also the light and reflection, sometimes vivid and startling, that seemed to echo these strata stories. So this experience and the desire to explore more aspects of engineer at, this, at a studio scale are the two influences for the Strata series. During the pandemic, I began to think a lot more about our past and present and future engagement with our environment. The found and manipulated signs are detritus from our built environment. I think of signage in this case as a symbol of our species priorities for how we care for and direct ourselves, often to the exclusion of other ecosystems. The scale of this piece, which is just called Strata 4, is four and a half feet by eight and a half feet and approximately seven inches deep. Technically it's a diptych that are fitted together. So it looks as if it is one facade. However, in producing this work, I discovered retro reflection. The found and manipulated signs have varying degrees of retro reflection. It, it's what a driver sees in the night as headlights wash over a highway sign. So a combination of shadow and a direct light source causes the strata surface to reflect and highlight the patinas. Retro reflection exposes, in my mind, the alter ego of this familiar object and exhibits a darker textural story. The irregular surface creates a tension and energy and in retro reflection, these angled surfaces respond to the focused light and dark of 
as the viewer moves about the piece. Here's a extreme close up of, of the of the irregular surface, so to speak, and how the light uh, is responding to it. Three of the pieces in the 2020 series use the old world technique of mosaic. Here, which is called strata one, combines the old world with contemporary material of the cut signage. Here it is in retro reflection. It's approximately three and a half feet by five feet. This part of the strata series, the mosaic part, uses sign reconfigurations that present our current society, at least in my mind, through the lens of future geological time, when all that we have constructed and valued becomes just another layer within the Earth's crust. And I find that there's kind of a terrible beauty in that vision. Here's a detail of strata one. And, and I'm just showing this because um, the surface of signage has evolved over decades. In this detail, one can see several of the many different generations of, of highway signs. And they all end up becoming important in how to construct for, for lighting and, and color. This is called Strata 2, uh, the second mosaic. It's approximately six feet by four feet. The surface patina, it shows the wear and tear of time. It hints at stories. Here's the retro reflection of, of that piece, and you can see even more of the patina. I'm, I was starting at this point to really explore the, the textural aspect of signs. And the, this will come up more in a piece like this. This is Strata 3, where, where I'm using the text and incorporating the other graphic details as an important component. The pressure of time takes our meanings and our intentions with text and alters it into something that is pretty much indecipherable of that piece. This is a detail from Strata 3 taken at an acute angle. You'll notice the red stripes. They are something that you can only, that can only be seen at acute angles. This material responds to the position of the human eye and will change as the eye moves to a different position. This is called strata five, approximately six feet by four feet. I return to something I used in the engineer work that the first work I showed you from 2019 of using oil washes to in a sense layer and, and the, the surface of the signs. I like adding, I like this sort of added layering especially in this case, because I wanted to tone down the bright red of the stop signs to a deeper like garnet red. But as you can see in retro reflection, the brightness of the red still shows through. Here's a detail of uh, strata five. Patina not only shows a time-worn surface, but it also shows engagement from society. Everything from holes to graffiti, I incorporate them all. In the upper left-hand corner, you can glimpse a handprint of paint and part of the surface. And for me, they're part of the story. For strata six, I'm just going to take you quickly through a rough idea of the process so that you could kind of understand what, what goes on. Um, so I, I cut up the, the signs in, in this case, in three widths, two inch, four inch, and six inch. They are then cut to various lengths between 12 inch and 30 inch. Then I will 
uh, have them bent anywhere from a 90 degree angle to a 160 degree angle. You can see uh, temporary markings on the ones at the, at the bottom there so that I can keep all of the, this massive stuff straight in my head. And then on the aluminum panel, it's a fabricated panel for which everything will be welded to. You will see lines and numbers. This is the progression of, of how the welding has to happen. Because obviously with this sort of mare's nest, you can easily weld yourself into a corner and not be able to insert the right piece in the right place. So having a numerical progression is absolutely necessary. Here's the piece again, laid out in the studio, roughly in the place where where it's about to be removed and the welding will start. Here's the finished piece in uh, retro reflect. As you can see, the text is very interesting to me and I'm very interested to see where that will, that, where that will take me in, in future series. This is Stratus 7, and it's the final piece of, of the 2020 Stratus series at this point. Uh, it's roughly three and a half by five feet. Initially, I thought it more restrained, especially in its color palette. I, there's a lot of dynamic energy in it, but it felt like I was moving in a more restrained direction. However, in retro reflection, it, it just showed a completely other side. So I'm, I'm still very much learning about this material and want to explore it more in, in exterior situations where it can really be part of an environment. And this is a close up of this. And the reason I wanted to show this sort of detail is not only do I look for the patina of time in these surfaces, but I also want the process of my making to be exposed. In this case, like the, the heat reactions to the signs from the welding, because basically the whole process is part of the story of the Strata series. Thank you. Excellent, Sheila. Thank you so much for coming on board and, and showing us this work. Uh, Strata series, that's a really impressive amount of work. And um, where is it going to be uh, mounted? Where, or where will we be able to see these things? Are they all public um, art? or? Uh, no, there. Um, it was a show I did in November of last year, and um, one of them is now in a private collection. And the rest, I'm I'm working on, as well as making new work. I'm working on trying to do a traveling exhibition of them. Oh, great. I'll I'll save my questions for the end, but I just wanted to kind of make those connections. Okay. Thanks. Uh, we'll move on from here. Um, <clears throat> our next presenter and our last but not least presenter is Jeff Schultz. He's a photographer living in Anchorage, Alaska. Jeff has been a full-time professional photographer in Anchorage since 1981. His work covers editorial, advertising, and corporate clients. He is one of the founders and former owners of the Alaska Stock Images, and he is probably best known as the official photographer of the Iditarod for nearly 40 years. So Jeff, take her away. Thank you all for having me and listening. Um, so the background of this um, was in 2019 was my 39th I did a ride. And quite frankly, I was just plain burnt out on shooting dogs. Um, it was, I was just in a rut. And somebody once said the only difference between a rut and a grave is depth. So I invited two very creative friends of mine, Matt Walzik and Andre Horton to dinner. And uh, I said, what can I do to get out of this rut? 
And we all immediately thought of portraits because I do a lot of, you know, landscape stuff in photography and I did a rod. And, you know, with I did a rod, um, I mean, I've shot just about everything possible that I could think of with I did a rod, buried a camera in the snow, shooting from airplanes, just a ton of different things, volunteers, big landscapes, um, aerial photography. And I just love it. There's so many great patterns out on Iditarod. But honestly, 39 years of it was just a bit much. So we thought about portraits, but then, you know, what portraits to do? Mushers, spectators. So they said, well, what if, look at this Humans of New York thing. Not only are they portraits, but it's the story about it. And so we, we thought about, you know, they showed me the Humans of New York. I didn't know anything about it at the time. And um, so I thought, okay, that's uh, portraits and stories, okay? But I wasn't wild about their portraits for humans of New York. So they said, well, take a look at, um, at a photographer named Joel Grimes. I didn't know about Joel Grimes, but this is, some, this is one of his works. And I went, wow, okay. That's, I want to get to that level with my photography and lighting. And so, um, but the problem here was I looked at some of Joel Grimes stuff and, you know, he's had some pretty decent equipment out there. And I'm thinking, how do we make this lightweight, portable, fast, easy, and weatherproof? Um, so uh, just kept moving forward. And um, this is one, a shot I did for Iditarod you know, probably five or eight years ago where they, they never even did use this particular image. But in any case, uh, Andre suggested, you know, who are these people? Who, who runs Iditarod? Who are the people that volunteer out there and stay up all night long and help these dogs and stuff? So he said, you know, get their name and their vocation, get their Iditarod story. Um, and then he, he brought up this one thing. He said, but go even deeper than that. Come up with a question that really gets to the heart of somebody. So we came up with the question that I would ask these people. I'd ask them four different questions. And the fourth one was, what in life do you know for sure? What is for sure in life to you? So that question really intrigued me. And then finally he suggested, and then on top of all that, record their answers. So with all, all of those um, things in play, I thought I, ha I thought I had a, a real good start for a project. Um, but then the question became, what about the background? You know, do we, you know, I shot a bunch of portraits over the years of uh, mushers with the Iditarod in the background. And I thought, you know, it's just, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, to me, it just doesn't speak to the person. There's too much going on. So um, we decided, or I decided, I guess, that I didn't want that. So I did all these portraits. The first year I did 250 of these portraits during Iditarod, outdoors, indoors, everywhere. And I did it all with the same background. Um, and then he suggested, um, and then put all this in a website. You can't do it in a book because people are talking. So uh, there's a website, facesofiditarod.com, where the background, you know, who the person is, what they do for a living, where the photo was taken, and then answers to those three questions about their Iditarod experience. Um, and a number of these people have passed away since then, like this gentleman, and the families are so happy to not only have a nice portrait of them, but also their, uh, their voice. So anyway, this is kind of some of the these are some of the portraits that I did. So they're all lit the exact same way. The background is the same. Uh, we asked the same questions of everybody and including that question from the heart, you know, who are they? And then uh, we recorded their voice and we recorded the voice just with an iPhone. We had to keep things simple as possible. So, um, so that's basically what I did if there was anything fun that they were doing, like eating a hot dog, we made that, or I made that part of the photo. This particular family here was out enjoying the Iditarod in the remote uh, checkpoint of Cripple. A whole family of four just flew in. 
this lady here makes pies in the town of Tecotna. You may have uh, heard about the great pies that are in Tecotna during Iditarod. This is a nine-year, this is a nine-year-old girl. And her favorite part about the Iditarod was stacking the wood. And when you hear this nine-year-old girl's voice and see her picture, it just kind of melts your heart. It's a pretty cool thing. So I just, I just, to me, I felt, especially being so deeply involved with Iditarod for 39 years, um, this was my kind of thing. So, uh, so that's what I did. Um, hearing the voice of, uh, uh, of the people talking about their situation was great. But then um, before we left for on the dinner, they, we thought about, well, the people are great, but what about the dog? Well, yeah, let, so let's think about that. So we ended, I ended up photographing the dogs as well, which of course the dogs are really the heroes of Iditarod more than the mushers. And then obviously we asked the questions of the mushers and I would argue that many of these mushers know more about the personality of their 20 or 30 or 50 sled dogs than some parents I know know about their kids it's just amazing, especially when you hear these mushers talk about these dogs prancing on their dog house and running around the dog yard and stuff. It's just an incredible uh, thing. I consider it like it's an anti-PETA statement. I mean, these dogs just plain love to run. So I want to quickly show uh, the website here. So this is the website on Iditarod.com. Now, after two years of this, there's 550 stories on there of the different people and the dogs. And when you go to the website, this is an 88-year-old man that I've known for 39 years. And I'm hoping you can hear this. Question that a guy has to study on. There's not many things I'm sure in life, but uh, if you're lucky enough to wake up tomorrow morning after you go to sleep tonight, then everything's fine. Were you able to hear that okay? Yeah, yeah, it's great. Good. Anyway, so to hear that 88-year-old gentleman say, if you wake up tomorrow morning, everything's fine. I mean, I just love it. So this, to me, this took my photography to the next level being able to have audio and the questions and of course the visual aspect. So um, for those of you who are photography types, I'll get this going here. And so this is kind of, this is my setup. I had to make it bulletproof, lightweight, like I said. So I've got a six foot collapsible gray uh, background there. And I have two, two light stands that's the, for each of these situations, you'll see the behind the scenes and then the photo that was made from it. Um, so this is uh, downtown Anchorage. It's a police officer. We're getting him to sign a model release. Um, so there's a 16 inch metal beauty dish. That's what this thing is right here, along with uh, a Canon speed light because it had to be lightweight. So, it, Whatever they were doing, I was into that. So these are spectators along the trail here. This is my assistant that went with me on the trail. We did this in sub-zero temperatures, outdoors, indoors. I'm using a 24 millimeter to 105 millimeter lens. Pretty much everything was shot at a 250th of a second at F9. It's kind of my go-to thing in this. I'd have to set up in the shade because that flash didn't quite overpower daylight. So uh, sometimes it was too windy, so the, someone had to hold the light stand. Many times the background got soaking wet, and we'd have to dry it out, setting it up just in a shed, anywhere we could. In the community hall in Ruby. So Many women did not like their portraits because the light is right above your head, lots of wrinkles. Um, I mean, it shows the real person. And that's the only 
negative feedback I got. Most people said these portraits, you can see into the person's soul in these things. And so I was really thrilled with that. But, you know, shooting it was actually quite, it was the easy part. Then the hard part was, or not harder, but it was it took longer. And that's, my assistant here is asking the three questions while I get ready for another portrait. So she's using the iPhone to, uh, to record. So, um, so then we created that online experience about it like you just saw. And so then I, after that, it, it was a real huge success. I mean, got a lot of compliments on it. It wasn't a money maker. It can't really be a money maker because it's a website. It can't really make a book out of it per se. Um, and it wasn't meant to be that. I only wish that I had this idea 25 or 30 years ago because I would have loved to have Joe Reddington's voice and a portrait like that and Herbie Nyakpuk and all those classic folks. But in any case, um, because it was a success, I decided to take it to do something in the summertime. So I basically did the same thing, only different. Um, it was different because I made it a square. I love shooting square. I used to shoot Hasselblad. So I made all the portraits square. I used a beauty dish, but it wasn't quite so harsh and right above the person. And I used the normal background they were in. And these are just everyday people. I'd just be driving around Anchorage well, this guy's John Van Zyl, so he's somebody we, a lot of us know. But um, mostly I'm just driving around Anchorage. This is a, a big game guide, Bucky Winkley. It is home at Rainy Pass Lodge. This is, we took a drive up the Dalton Highway, and this is a gal who sells her artwork at a roadside stand. And it's just wonderful getting to know them, getting to know these people and spending time. Um, Susan Butcher, the Iditarod Musher was a good friend of mine. I photographed their wedding. This is her husband, Dave Munson, at their home in Fairbanks. And then again, just I, I love this gal's wave and her smile was just great. So I had to stop and photograph her. And she was just, she was wonderful. Um, it was, I think it was, I don't know, it was five or seven below zero. So I took her into my truck to uh, do the interview. So not only be warmer, but also it was, uh, you could, didn't have the sound of the traffic nearby. So, and it's kind of funky, you know, you just walk up to somebody like this and I just say, hi, I'm Jeff Schultz. I'm a photographer and I'm doing this special project. And I've only been turned down once out of the numbers that I've done. So I've been happy about that. This gentleman is, um, he runs wall mics. If you've ever been up through Trapper Creek and if you've never stopped in there, he's got quite the eclectic store. But I still ask, so these guys, I ask them a question just about Alaska, what they love about Alaska, why they live here, that kind of thing. But then I still ask them that fourth question, what in life do you know for sure? So um, I'll quickly just show you that website, which is, so the Iditarod website, that was sponsored by ExxonMobil for one year. Rasmussen gave a grant for one year, um, but I've done it, I've, I've done the thing for two years. My Faces of Alaska project is just on my own website. And so again, they're square and they look uh, similar but different. Anyway, I just enjoy the whole project. It's different for me anyway. So I know we're running late, and that's really all I really had, though. So there you have it. Well, it's splendid. Just uh, uh, I love both your projects. I'm uh, most interested in the uh, one where you're recording voices. Uh, I've got similar project. Uh, not nearly as well executed as what you've got, so you've got no competition there. Um, <clears throat> so I guess that uh, that wraps it up. I'm going to uh, I'm going to open it up for questions now, so you can unmute yourselves and you can ask questions to any of the four presenters. Um, if you've got uh, uh, notes of appreciation, accolades, and congratulations, please put those in the chat window. Let's just keep this to questions. I, I have a question for Mark. 
Uh, you showed such a wide range of wide array of different types of bodies of work and so forth. And I just, I'm curious, are there any of them that are favorite children? Ones that are either, either bodies of work or individual pieces that have special meaning for you as a person and as an artist? Well, I think they all have special meaning to me when I make them. And typically my favorite one is the one I'm working on right now. So, and, and also be aware that these are really compressed uh, portfolios to, to stay within 15 minutes. And some were left out entirely, it had to be done. I uh, wish we could do an, an hour presentation on each of the presenters. Uh, Mark's got just a tremendous amount of work. Uh, the first work I've seen of his was the, um, uh, geez, what did you call it? It was the, uh, uh, the, the black sheep and the... Oh, I called those the Tableau series. The Tableau series, yeah. That was, <laughs> was stunning to, to run across those in the uh, uh, jury shows here um, oh, in Alaska. And each of those were telling a story. Yes. Mm -hmm. I couldn't really drill down on the stories that they told in this presentation, but you think about a long time and they take a long time to set up and photograph. Matter of fact, I was thinking about uh, asking if you would come back and do just that one series and give us the stories of each one of them. Maybe something I'll, to consider. Consideration. <laughs> okay. I have a question for uh, Sheila. This is Cheryl Riley. Hi, Cheryl. Yeah. Hi, Sheila. So this is about uh, signage being inherently um, about messaging. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that uh, collides with what you're doing. It collides in what way? What are you thinking? Yep. Can you hear me? Well, um, is it a factor? Yeah. Is it a factor at all in... Um, your decisions to, um, does it overlap in any way? Perhaps it doesn't. But I think for me, the, especially the text of signage, I'm in, in the strata series, in my mind's eye, I'm kind of looking past when humans are around, so to speak. You were on that 2019 uh, trip with me and and just seeing you know there are so many years beyond when humans have been around and how things get compressed down so i'm looking at the signage as we are so present in the moment and we we are so articulate with what we sh we want to be doing or should be doing or trying to keep ourselves safe but over time that message is going to, through the pressure of time, is going to degrade and break up and become something that is other. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but but I, that's how I look at how to incorporate. You are. I, I love your answers. Okay. But certain messages exceed time. Oh, you or think no, re that? no longer relevant. <laughs> they're no longer relevant. I think they're they're an artifact. They're an artifact of of you know a species that lived for. I mean, you could have a species live for a million years and still, in the long geological span of time, that's still kind of a blink, and we're not even approaching that, N not remotely yet. So. Um, at, at least, you know, homo sapiens. So, and whether we'll get to that or not, at some point, all of our messaging is going to become an artifact and whether it can be decoded or not at that point, I, I couldn't say. So I, I just think of it as something more in the abstract. It, it's the remnants. It's the remnants of our intention from way back when, when we were alive. Uh, so Tammy and uh, um, Carrie, how, how this is kind of a new thing for you, this collaboration thing, is it not? I'm here. 
Mm-hmm. Yes, it is. It's it's fairly new. We did collaborate um, on the uh, book that you had mentioned, Carrie's book, uh, Drunk on Love, in that I did a cold wax painting and photographed that, and that was used as the cover. Um, uh, act, well, everything I write, Tammy, is almost read it and, and uh, gives me feedback on it, but it's just not formal. And everything you look at that she's almost everything, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm giving feedback on it all the way through and um, sometimes that creates problems uh, in a relationship, you know. Um, but uh, the one thing we agreed on is that I would be free to write whatever I wanted about these things. Uh, I mean, Tammy would have an intent and so that's been a little adjustment. Um, there's one here that's really great. Uh, uh, it was the day it happened. Is about uh, when a, a woman's first menstruation, that, that blue thing with the little red dot in it. Um, I mean, that really struck me. My sister, when I was, I don't know, 20, and she was just a little girl, uh, I came home and she was just bent over crying. I said, what's wrong? And uh, and then my I was alone with my daughter and she and I had to run out and get something for her. I was prepared for it and, but um, so it is new and different and um, it's kind of enjoyable uh, as long as we're both free uh, and don't have to please the other um, but it is it is tricky it is tricky you know yeah because there's a fine line between um, honesty and <laughs> and being hurtful. <laughs> But no, honesty, I mean, it helps. You have to be able to do that, to be able to make progress and to make nice, cohesive work that is a unit. Um, so, yeah, it's fairly new, but we're... Um, now, I when I write, uh, I mean, I've written, I have a noir probably coming out also, but I listen to different kinds of music, and I think there should be more cross-fertilization of the arts um, and, 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 and make it intentional that this inspires that or something. I just, um, anyway, so it, I, I like working with Tammy and I think differently about things as a result of her work. That's a great question. We we'll, might answer differently in a, in a, in a year. Uh, I'll try not to do that. <laughs> uh, I'm glad that things are working out for, the, for you that way. It's always nice to, have a collaborator, and, and yes, when you mix uh, different genres of the arts, you can come up with some pretty amazing things. It takes you out of your out of your box. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Hal. Hey, I remember, uh, Sheila, when you did that uh, show over at the museum, I don't know when it was, 20 years ago, I don't know where the, 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 the wind was blowing and the papers would go flying around and the Bibles and... Oh, yes. Like, well, so... You you could not do that in your uh, where you do your work, right? I mean, you had to set it up someplace. And, but now you're working. This stuff happens in a in a uh, enclosed environment. Well, right. I mean, certain parts of my work happen in an enclosed environment, and then um, other parts of my work are uh, either site specific. You know, and sometimes I, the studio can build them, but sometimes I have to work with much bigger companies to build them for me. Well, uh, you know, when we did our run through yesterday, Hal mentioned MoMA. Did you have a piece in MoMA? No, I think he, I think he was pulling everybody's leg on that <laughs> one. Yeah. Well, well. Oh, come on! Don't be. will be there. They It'll should be there, be there. now. Um, how, how would you describe yourself? I mean, just artist or or sculptor, or, uh, I mean, I don't know how to describe you. Well, that's always been a big problem. (laughs) It's a, it's a, uh, uh, I, I've gotten to the point of just calling myself an artist. Um, To people who don't know the arts, sometimes I will use the word sculptor, but primarily I, I just think of myself as an artist these days. It's the easiest way because I work in so many different formats and so many different materials. It, it, would, it would be a very long explanation if I tried to do it. So artists like cuts it short, keeps it sweet, 
and boom, we're there. Do you uh, look, look at calls for art in these different genre or venues around the country and submit stuff, or do you just, it's Sheila Wine, you're going to do what you're going to do and then see if somebody likes it. I mean, do you ever submit to competitive shows? I, I don't do so much competitive shows, but I do uh, submit for uh, public artwork because I work, I, I've, I work from a site-specific um, angle, which means I'm looking at both the site, the context of the site, and the community that's around the site. And, and that, gives me, uh, that gives me a freedom to still work it out from my perspective if you understand what I mean. That doesn't mean I get it. I seldom get them, but it gives me it it gives it gives me the freedom I need to think the way I think, if that makes final, sense. Final question. Did did you have to outgrow your your artwork at UAA? I mean you studied under some great people. Or is it a continuation or uh, I mean I, you know I worked at UAA a long time and I, I just was it a hindrance or it's like damn I'm glad I'm done with that? Uh, well, I, damn, I was glad I was done with that, but it wasn't because of, um, being a hindrance. It, I'm, I did my first two installations there at UAA and, and that, that really broadened, uh, my perspective of what, because I, I always knew I worked in 3D, but I didn't realize until until I was there at UAA that I could work at three work at 3D where a person could walk through the 3D thing. Because I wasn't familiar with the installation format until I went there, so it it turned out to be very very useful for me. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm glad I'm glad I got that experience. Well, it's had a big impact on your uh, one percent for art. Uh, projects as well. To a certain degree, it did because it just helped me start thinking about sight. You know, sight and and the the broader connotations, almost more like a designer, architect, or a landscape designer, or something like that. Where, but but I'm I'm taking in other sorts of aspects as well. Um, like like who's who who moves through this site on a regular basis basis is it is it small children is it is it a random community is it mainly moose you know i mean what who is it that uses this site and then i i think about it in those terms and when did you uh divorce uh, design from uh, from craftsmanship, oh. and you know what I mean by that. Um, well, I I discovered early on a uh, the, which needed to come first. The, there was a teacher who said uh, a. A craftsman comes up with an idea, a craftsperson comes up with an idea and then tries to figure out how to do it within their craft, whether it's wood or ceramic or glass or whatever. A an artist comes up with an idea and looks around for the best material to implement that idea. And that just made so much sense to me. And I realized it's like, oh, I'm not... I'm not a craftsperson, you know, and I really admire craft a lot. There's uh, the skill sets galore, just, you know, kind of make me foam at the mouth sometimes. You know, I wish I had those skill sets, but, uh, but understanding that the idea comes first, not the material comes first and, and, you know, try to progress accordingly w really helped me um, get oriented. Well, I think what I was getting at was the um, the difference, uh, or rather, letting go of having to be a product person, a person who makes things, rather than, as opposed to somebody who designs things. So you can mm. hire other people to do welding, or you know, uh, you know. Well, 
I had to decide early on um, within uh, when I first started understanding about public art, it's like, okay, I've got two choices. I can only propose things that I can completely do in my own studio, but that will have a certain limitation factor on it. But if, but there, there are machines needed for larger work that my studio will never have. So do I want to do those? And I decided that I wanted the option if, if the idea fit the site that I could collaborate with fabricators to, to build what was in my head. Else it was just, you know, going to make me crazy if I couldn't get it out of my head. So, you know, there, there was a bit of mental health there probably too, of, of just being able to, it's the idea, it's the idea. If I can build it, great. If I can hire a bunch of people to come in and build it within my studio, great. If I have to go outside of my studio, I'm fine with that as well. And it's been interesting because it, um, you know, they know me at Steel Fab, for example. They know me at General Mechanical. And, you know, and sometimes they want to run when I walk in the door. It's like, oh, my God. You know, here she comes again, and what crazy I did as she have now. But to a certain degree, they kind of like it too. They just, they just don't want to admit it. You know, it's, it's a, it, it's something different. It's a problem solving thing. Well, yes, go I have, ahead. I have a question of you. Hmm. What? I'm not a presenter. No, <laughs> but, I, but as a host, I mean, you, you if other artists that. May, we might know want to submit something. What are the criteria to that you want? There's no criteria. They just None. email they, me and say they would like to pre fifteen minutes. To, or they like to present something and 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 what it's about. Yes, I'll need a title. I need a picture, and I need. Uh, hmm, I think for the initial, it would be nice if they told me what they were thinking of. You know, beyond the or beyond the title topic because these are really interesting um zoom is just a boring thing but this wasn't um <laughs> and the last one i saw i mean they're really interesting so thanks hal um and from what you said last night during the dry run there are spaces you you intend to do this for july and august is that true America. well I, I have one space left open in uh july and uh nothing and no nobody has signed up for august and if so if that continues uh when we do july's presentation this will that will probably be the last presentation of this series i'm surprised that not more people are are interested to do it but i also know that it's difficult you know to do public speaking and maybe you don't have the confidence to show your work, but believe me, you know, everybody that's shown here uh, has done a great job, and I think the audience has been um, very appreciative of every artist, no matter what genre they were working in <clears throat> or what level of art that, that they're at. So uh, I, this is uh, very egalitarian. Uh, I have, uh, I'm not a curator, and I don't intend to be a curator for this series. Maybe in a future series, I don't know. But this is really quite open and serendipitous. So whoever signs up and uh, the order is usually arrived at from the uh, four presenters. They decide who's going to go first, second, and third, and fourth. Um, so I don't really have a lot to do with it. I'm just kind of a, um, a focal point to get them out. If I were a better speaker, I would do this as an interview type situation. But uh, I could not carry that off. I'm absolutely certain of that. <laughs> uh, not a question, Hal, but a request. Sure. Uh, this is for Jeff. I think you should expand your uh, portraiture to the creative community. <laughs> well, Jeff has signed off for the evening. He was uh, uh -huh. at a at a very important meeting, dinner meeting, and he took uh, 15, 20 minutes out of it so he could come and do his presentation. Oh, that's sweet. But this will go up on uh, 
uh, YouTube and I'll make a special note to them to let them know that there's uh, some questions or at least some suggestions to them. You mm -hmm. might want to review it. Okay, thanks. So. Yeah, great. Okay, well, a lot of new faces here. Thanks for coming again. Um, uh, if you or you know someone who would like to uh, present, please have them drop me an email at halgage, H-A-L-G-A-G-E, at Alaska, that's the state I live in, dot net. And uh, I'll certainly get back to you with uh, what's required of you. Of course, you've seen tonight's uh, presentation, so it's pretty obvious what's required. Uh, so seeing that there are no more questions, next month, July 12th, 6 p.m., tune in to hear from and see work by abstract painter Kim Collins uh, Marcucci, uh, painter Linda Lucky, and uh, special guest documentary photographer Theo Anderson from Philadelphia. He'll be staying up quite late in order to make his presentation. Uh, we end this meeting with our traditional hand wave and sign off from everyone. So unmute yourselves, wave your hand, and say, Bye! 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 Thanks, Al. Good night. Thank you. Good, good night. Bye. See you next month. Thank you.